Hello everyone. So for the last couple of weeks I've been in the process of reunifying my right brain, which is my creative side, and my left brain, which is my scientific side. I think for too long now I have been living far too much in my right brain, um, and I think it's all about being whole brain. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's about overly living in one side or the other. It's about being scientifically creative, if you will. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what I've been doing. I've been reading Enlighten Next, that magazine I referred to in the last video, and just really, really getting back into the mindset of critical thinking. You know, does this make sense? I need to look into this, I need to delve into this, I, I can't just take things for face value. So yeah, that's what I've been doing. And the guy that um, is in this article, Stuart Hammeroff, is a great inspiration to me because I think he's a perfect example of someone that has mastered the art of unifying both hemispheres of the brain. And so in just a sec I'm going to read that article out, but... Let me just warn you before I start, it is pretty heavy duty, it's going to be pretty long, it's going to be hard to follow at points, you might have to re-watch bits to fully grasp the concept that he's trying to convey to you all. It's complicated stuff, but it's science, it's hard science. Um, so what else can you expect really? Uh, there's a lot of big words, there's words that I read that I had no idea of the meaning, I've had to look up meanings at points to clarify certain issues. It's heavy duty, like I said, it's very heavy duty. Um, this could potentially be another two or three parts long, so I understand a lot of you are probably not going to make it to the end, uh, you're just going to think, oh no, this is too much for me, and that's fine, that's cool. Um, I would really encourage everyone to at least um, watch it to the end once though, because um, it's towards the end that it really starts all falling into place and making sense, and that's when the mind will just blow um, from the realisation of the magnitude of what he's talking about. It's absolutely fascinating, so I really do implore you all to give it a try, um, but hey, I perfectly understand if it's not your cup of tea, and if it's not, that's fine, because normal um, broadcasting will resume after these videos. Um, I don't plan on making this a regular thing, like me sitting down and reading a really heavy duty article. But this is something special that needs to be broadcast to as many people as possible. And hey, not many people watch my videos, but there's normally a few thousand that watch each one. So I, I feel um, like it's my duty to share this, you know. This is important, in my opinion. And one last thing before I start is that in the next video I'm going to be doing some sort of competition. <clears throat> this will be a fairly regular thing that I'll probably do every couple of weeks where I'll just be giving away my latest book or my latest magazine that I've read because once I've read something I rarely read it again and it seems silly just to waste my reading material and let it mount up on the side just doing nothing. So yeah, in the next video I'm going to be giving this away to someone, uh, I'll be covering the PMP and everything, so it's literally free, I'm just going to give it away, and we're going to have a little competition, and one of you will win it. Okay, enough talking, uh, let's start story time with Reese. Okay, so it goes back and forth between the magazine and Stuart Hammeroff, the magazine and Stuart Hammeroff, it's like a little transcript of, of, of what they talked about in the interview. So, um, I'll let you know when the magazine's speaking, and I'll let you know when Stuart's speaking. So, it starts off with the magazine, and they say, You're best known as one of the world's leading proponents of a quantum physics-based theory of the mind. How did you first become interested in the mystery of consciousness? And Stuart says, I first got interested in consciousness whilst taking a philosophy course in college in the late 1960s. Studying mostly science and math, I took a course called Philosophy of Mind and was intrigued by the problem of explaining how conscious experience arises from the pinkish grey meat we call the brain. And I remained interested throughout medical school, being drawn towards fields having to do with consciousness, like psychiatry, neurology, neurosurgery, etc. etc. But one day, whilst doing research in a cancer lab in the early 1970s, I was looking at cells dividing under a microscope observing how the DNA containing chromosomes were separated and pulled apart into perfectly equal mirror images of each other. 
These tiny strands called microtubules and these little machines called centrioles, which were composed of microtubules, would pull the chromosomes apart in an elegant dance that had to be perfect, because if not, they divided unequally. Abnormal cancer cells would then result. So he's just fascinated by how these tiny, minuscule little things, you know, seemingly have some sort of consciousness. How they're, like he said, in this elegant dance, and it's perfectly constructed, because if there was just one slip-up in that elegant dance, cancer would arise, which obviously it does sometimes, but more often than not, it doesn't. So 99.9% .9 of the time, um, these tiny little things, these microtubules and these centrioles, are dancing this dance, and it's absolutely perfect. So there must be consciousness behind that, right? Or at least some sort of cognitive function. So Stuart continues, For some reason I became fixated on how these little molecular machines knew exactly what to do. I wondered how they were organised and guided, and whether there might be some intelligence, if not consciousness, at that level. Around the same time, it was discovered that these microtubules existed in all cells, especially neurons. Brain neurons are just full of them. So it occurred to me that microtubules, which seemed to display some kind of intelligence or consciousness in cell division, might have something to do with consciousness in the brain. I was in medical school in Philadelphia then, and after I graduated, I decided to take a clinical internship in Tucson, Arizona, to figure out what I wanted to do next. I was leaning towards neurology, but then I met the chairman of anesthesiology at the new University of Arizona Medical School Hospital. He told me that if I really wanted to understand consciousness, I should figure out how anaesthesia works, because anaesthesia selectively erases consciousness while sparing other brain functions. And of course, anyone that's even vaguely familiar with how an operation in a hospital would work knows this. You are given anaesthesia and you black out. Your brain continues functioning. Your body continues working but yet your consciousness seems to be erased, or at least taken somewhere else. He showed me a paper that a colleague of his had written in 1968, suggesting that if you apply the gases used in anaesthesia to microtubules, they depolymerize, which basically means they fall apart. So there was a theory that anaesthesia worked by deconstructing brain microtubules. It turns out, fortunately, that that's not the case. You need about five times the amount of anaesthesia for microtubule breakdown than you need to cause somebody to lose consciousness. But regardless, it showed that anaesthetics do affect the microtubules in some sort of way, which further suggested that these things might have something to do with consciousness. So the magazine asks, what exactly is a microtubule? And Stuart responds with, microtubules are molecular assemblies they're cylindrical polymers composed of repeating patterns of a single peanut-shaped protein called tubulin that can flex open and closed. The tubulin proteins self-assemble into these beautifully elegant hollow cylinders with walls arranged in hexagonal lattices. And these cylinders form the cytoskeleton, the bone-like structural support or scaffolding inside all animal cells. But they're continually moving and rearranging. These rearrangements account for all cell growth, development, movement, and synaptic regulation. Pretty important stuff. Now, the more asymmetrical a cell is, the more it needs the structural support. So, neurons with their long axons and dendrites need a lot of microtubules. Now, if you look inside a single neuron, you see hundreds of microtubules composed of something like 100 million tubulin protein subunits. You could say that neurons are actually made of microtubules. And the magazine says, wow, interesting stuff. Most people think that consciousness arises from activity between brain cells or neurons. But you're saying, well, no, it may actually be these extraordinarily tiny structures within neurons that provide the real physical basis for consciousness. And to that, Stuart says, yes. Exactly. Okay, so tune back tomorrow for part three. I'll uh, see you later. Bye-bye.